Good morning, I'm Ewan Mullins, Head of Crops Research, and delighted you're able to join us for today's webinar. Today we have seven presenters detailing research findings of relevance to several ongoing issues in the tillage sector. As usual, the session is live on YouTube and Facebook, and the full recording will be available on our YouTube Crops channel straight after the session when it ends. Also, please send your questions in through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get through the questions and as many of them as we can through the webinar and at the Q&A session at the end. So before we go to Minister McConnellogue, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce and welcome Professor Frank O'Mara, our recently appointed Director of Chagas, who wishes to say a few words. Good morning and welcome to what is the second session of this year's virtual tillage conference. In the first session held two weeks ago, we had presentations from David Wall, Richie Hackett and Dermot Forreston covering the critical issues you need to consider in order to optimize crop nutrient management strategies for the season ahead. Today's session will have a different focus and will highlight the progress and results from important pest and pathogen surveillance initiatives that Oak Park staff have been conducting. For example, in recent years, we have invested heavily in our BYDV monitoring network through the installation of suction towers in Cork, Oak Park and Dublin plus the newly installed digital PCR system at Oak Park. And I'm delighted to see this work now delivering results, which you're going to hear about later this morning. This is an important step, and the future plans of the program at Oak Park, which you will hear about shortly, will see this expanded further in 2022. Similarly, for grass weeds and cereal disease control, our research strategy is tailored to assist the sector in dealing with problems that currently exist. Meanwhile, the challenges on the horizon are the focus of our PhD driven research, some of which you will also hear about this morning. We know the tillage sector underpins so many agri food enterprises, the length and breadth of the country. Similarly, we know the potential of the sector to expand its role. Chagas is committed to supporting this through increased investment in both infrastructure and people at our research centre in Oak Park. On top of recent capital investments, some of which I've mentioned, this year we intend to fill two new researcher posts to drive on our strategic plans in crop improvement, as well as the whole support for the brewing and distilling sector. I expect the existing collaboration between our crops and food and environment programs will continue and expand, thereby further supporting opportunities as they develop. To conclude, I hope you find this morning's session productive and engaging, and I would encourage you to complete the post-event survey that will be circulated after the webinar, because we do value your feedback. I would now like to welcome and introduce Minister McConnell. Thank you, Frank, for the introduction. Chagas Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your invitation to address the 2022 Chagas National Tillage Conference. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to address the conference, and I look forward to the next conference being held in person. The last two years has been a difficult and challenging time for everyone due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but hopefully we have turned a corner. Farm families ensured that there was food on the tables of the country and kept the cogs of a 13.5 billion euro export sector turning throughout that period. From the outset, it is important that we recognise the importance of a viable, sustainable tillage sector in this country, critically supplying important feed and straw to the livestock sector, but also increasing the provision of raw material for the growing brewing, distilling and consumer food markets. I'm a huge fan of the tillage sector, and I want to see it thrive and grow, especially over the lifetime of the next common agricultural policy. 2021 was a solid year for tillage farmers, with the value, the value of the tillage sector in 2021 exceeding 730 million at farm gate prices. And that's something that can't be forgotten. And I'm committed to supporting this very important sector of Irish agriculture. I'm pleased to see that the cereal area has begun to stabilize in recent years, following several years of decline. And indeed, the overall cereal area in 2021 was almost 274,000 hectares representing an increase of 3% in the cereal area in 21. One of the objectives of the Food Vision 2030 strategy is to retain the area under tillage with an ambition to increase the area grown to crops 
and I will support the industry to achieve this target. I'm optimistic that 2022 will be another good year for the sector, and I'm pleased to see the estimated area sown to the higher yielding winter crops has been maintained and increased for some crops, and these crops by and large have come through the winter well and look to have good potential at this stage, but obviously as we all know there is some way to go to harvest. The current market price of crops grown for this harvest coming is forecast to remain solid, thankfully. Having said that, I'm acutely aware of the challenges tillage farmers will face this year. The immediate challenge for tillage farmers in 2022 is the pressure and input costs, in particular fertilizer, something I've consistently raised at EU Council meetings. It is important that we look to manage the cost of production and mitigate the impact. I have tasked Chuggles to work with all sectors and I'm glad to have just launched the Chuggles Soils, Nutrients and Fertilizer campaign 2022 to assist farmers make informed decisions and choices as to how they manage their current crop nutrient requirements for this year. The goal of today's conference is to disseminate through to practice research solutions and how it can support farmers decision making as they plan ahead. I recognize how important research is and how it can contribute to higher yields, better quality crops, reduced disease and more efficient farming practices. As we all know, climate change is co coming more to the forefront and will affect us all. From a climate change perspective, tillage farmers are viewed very positively. It is well recognized that the tillage sector has the lowest greenhouse gas and ammonia profile of any sector in Irish agriculture and is considered well placed to take advantage of its low emission profile in the time ahead. The next cap will contain several support schemes that will specifically target tillage farmers. These include the strong corporation measure and the protein A scheme. As you know, I introduced the strong corporation measure in 2021 on a pilot basis, and I'm very pleased to see that there has been strong support for the scheme from applicants, which saw in the region of 8 million euro paid out to farmers. And I'm happy to be able to repeat my commitment to this scheme for 2022. The scheme is also an integral part of our next cap with a budget of 50 million for the duration of the cap program between 2023 and 27. The voluntary coupled protein aid scheme is yet another valuable support to tillage farmers worth around 3 million euro annually and I plan to support the expansion in protein crops by increasing the level of funding for growing protein crops from the current level of 3 million to 7 million euro per year. Another scheme my department administers is the Tillage Capital Investment Scheme under TAMS. There has been a significant level of interest and investments under this measure in TAMS too. And to date my department paid out in excess of 27 million euro to over 1,500 tillage farmers under the Tillage Capital Investment Scheme. This represents a significant level of investment in the sector by my department. Again, I thank Chugosk for inviting me to address the conference and wish it every success and I hope that you enjoy what I know will be very informative presentations today. And now I hand you over to Ewan to continue the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for your remarks and for taking the time to address the conference this morning. So let's get started. Our first talk today is a joint presentation by Louise McNamara and Stephen Byrne. Louise heads up our entomology program and Stephen leads one of our molecular genetics research programs here at Oak Park. And their talk will give us an update on the Chagas AFID monitoring network. So over to you, Louise. Thanks, Ewan. Um, so first of all, I'll start with a background to um, BYDV and cereal aphids. So grain aphids, as you can see here, and bird cherry oat aphids are major vectors of barley owl dwarf virus. Barley owl dwarf virus can cause yield losses to cereals of up to 80% with a severe infection. Control can be complicated due to insecticide resistance emergence. For example, in the grain aphid, we now have partial resistance to uh, pyrethroids, which you probably know as knockdown resistance or KDR. Our research aims of this work was to quantify incidence of barley owl dwarf virus and insecticide resistance in migrating aphids. And we want to know how does this help inform farmers' decision making? 
So first of all, what is the Chagas aphid monitoring network? So as you can see here, we have constructed three uh, suction towers, one in Carlo, in Oak Park, one in Cork, and one in Ashtown in Dublin. These are 12.2 meter suction towers, uh, and they're based on the design by Rottenstead Research, who have an aphid monitoring network that has been going more than 50 years. So essentially, these are 12.2 meters tall, and what happens is aphids flying overhead, and all the insects flying overhead, are caught and dragged into collection vessels at the bottom. Um, so now we're going to show a short video that gives an overview of the Chagas um, suction tower network and the associated diagnostic platform. So that's an overview of the suction tower network and diagnostics platform. Next, we look at what kind of data it generates. Um, so to explain this slide, along the x-axis, you have the months of the year, and the y-axis, you have the number of aphids. The red line is the mean temperature, and the bars are the number of aphids. The dark blue is the bird cherry oat aphid, or paddy, and the light blue is Cytobia novena, the green aphid. What we can see here is that aphid migration started around the end of March, start of April, and ended around uh, the end of November, start of December. In terms of temperature, what we know is that around 11 to 15 degrees, aphid flight um, kicks off, but it, they can also fly at suboptimal conditions. We then took those grain aphids and brought them to the lab and tested them for resistance, which is KDR, and for BYDV, the virus. So the dark green bars are aphids that tested negative for both virus and negative for resistance. The yellow is aphids that test negative for BYDV and positive for resistance. Orange has tested uh, positive for virus and negative for resistance, and pink has tested both positive for virus and resistance. So then we can look at 2021 in Oak Park and see how they compare. And this year, we actually saw a lot more grain aphids captured in Carlo. We also saw a later start to the spring flight um, because of cold spring conditions. When we take those grain aphids to the lab and test them, although overall we have a lot more grain aphids, we actually see a lot more, a higher proportion of aphids testing negative for both virus and KDR. So again, here, the dark green is aphids that have tested negative for the virus and for resistance. We also have a tower now in Cork, and these are the results for 2021. Again, a late start to spring flight because of colder spring temperatures and um, lower numbers of grain aphids in Cork than in Carlo. But what we don't know yet is exactly how these numbers um, affect what's happening in the field. And we have trials in place that will help us learn this. When we take the green aphids from Cork to the lab and test them for resistance in BYDV, uh, again, the dark green is negative for virus and for resistance. Yellow is negative for virus and positive for resistance. Orange is positive for virus and negative for resistance. And pink is positive for virus and positive for resistance. So we had a look there at the effect on temperature, and we know that above 11, 15 degrees, we get increased aphid flights, but other weather factors also affect aphid migration. 
So when, so I'll just explain this slide here. So on the y-axis is rain in sum of millimeters going from zero up to 20. The x-axis is temperature going up here up to 25. The circles represent the number of grain aphids and the larger the circle, the more grain aphids that were captured. And what we can see here in terms of rain is when the rain is low and the temperature is higher, we get the most grain aphids. And when the temperature is low, and the rain is high, we don't capture aphids migration. We can do the same thing for wind. Here on the y-axis is wind kilometer per hour is going from zero to 25. And again, temperature increasing along the x-axis. Again, the larger the circle, the more the grain aphids. And what we see is that zero kilometer per hour winds, we didn't actually catch any grain aphids in the suction towers. Between five and 10 kilometers per hour and 15 and 20 degrees, we caught the most grain aphids. So what we've learned so far from our aphid monitoring network is that there was a six fold increase in grain aphid numbers in Oak Park in 2021 versus 2020, but there was more than a 50% reduction in proportion of aphids carrying BYDB. The next step is to understand how that then affects virus pressure in the field. We know that grain aphid flight is influenced by temperature, wind and rain, and our take home message is that aphid numbers alone does not give the full picture of what is happening. We also need to have information about resistance levels and virus pressure. Continuous monitoring is required to understand how these tra trends change over time and how um, different weather in different years affects virus pressure. So the next step is to connect monitoring data with infield disease pressure. So that's where we are right now. And our next part of the talk is to discuss what our next steps for the monitoring network and associated diagnostic platform is. So Stephen is going to give an overview of the diagnostic platform now. So Louise has spoken about how the sample, sampling network has been growing over the last couple of years. So it started off in 2020 with a single 12.2 meter tower in Oak Park uh, with aphids collected daily uh, and the grain and bird cherry aphids were taxonomically identified. And then PCR reactions were carried out uh, to identify aphids with uh, knockdown resistance. So this expanded last year uh, with daily collections from two 12.2 meter suction towers. So one in Oak Park and one in Cork. And then in addition to identifying the key insects and the knockdown resistance, uh, we began carrying out PCR reactions for the presence and absence of BYDV. So now moving into 2022, uh, we have three 12.2 meter suction towers um, the addition of three two to six meter mobile suction towers and then many infield traps. And Louise will talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, so our sample numbers are increasing, uh, but also our ambition to collect more data. For example, we'd like to monitor AFID and BYD, BYDV diversity. Um, so this means that we basically need to expand our testing capacity. So we're now developing a high throughput and inexpensive diagnostics platform to support the routine monitoring and also enable us to capture this extra information. So this will allow us to basically extract DNA RNA from a single aphid and then use a single assay that will enable us to generate DNA profiles to monitor aphid diversity, um, identify uh, if the aphid is carrying the, the knockdown resistance, uh, identify if the aphid is carrying uh, BYDV, and then also identify uh, what strain of BYDV um, that the aphid is carrying. And again, the main reason we're doing this is to support uh, the AFID monitoring network and to generate data that can then feed into the development of IPM programs uh, that Louise will talk about now. So what are our next steps in terms of BYDV control? So overall, our goal is to improve our IPM program for BYDV control in Ireland. To do this, we want to pair local monitoring with long distance migration monitoring. Then we want to pair the monitoring network with IPM trials to see how this information can inform farmers' decisions. We want to validate and develop um, robust decision support systems for BYDV control in Ireland. And we want to incorporate tolerant varieties into our IPM program. To explain a bit more about our local and long distance migration monitoring, as I said, we have three 12.2 meter suction towers in Dublin, uh, Carlow and Cork. With that, we're going to pair portable two to six meter suction samplers to sample aphids at different heights. And also we want to have in-field 
um, monitoring both with yellow traps like these. So the yellow attracts insects and they're, it's placed at crop height and also a uh, crop walking. So visual searching for aphids. Um, and the idea is to then compare the information you get from all the different monitoring networks to see how you can inform farmers' decisions. Um, we're looking for farmers who would be interested in hosting yellow traps in both their spring barley and their winter barley. And if you're interested in being involved, you can contact us on the bottom emails there. So lastly, we'd like to thank everyone who was involved in uh, generating this information and doing this work. Thank you very much. And we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you both. Uh, it's great to see the integration of disciplines, entomology with, with molecular diagnostics to develop the network. We just have time for, for a few questions. So Stephen, I'm gonna throw the first one at you. Um, you mentioned the diagnostics on aphids and doing KDR and BYDV, but is there any testing done for BYDV in the crops? Um, absolutely. So in parallel, we're also developing our capacity to look at the virus uh, in plant material. Um, this has traditionally been done using um, serological methods, so similar to, to antigen testing, but we're developing our PCR methods to increase the specific, specificity uh, and basically allow us to identify what strain of BYDV is infecting the plant. Um, so at the same time, we're also interested in being able to quantify viral load in the plant, uh, and we're developing this using our digital droplet PCR platform that we've been setting up in the last few months. Um, so we can then begin to look at the, the viral load in, in different varieties, including potentially tolerant lines. Okay, great, excellent. So Louise, on, on your plots there, you showed obviously the, the number of bird cherry uh, oat aphids was very different to the grain aphids in the tower catch. Does this mean that the bird cherry aphids are causing more of a problem? Um, not necessarily. So the amount of aphids you catch in suction towers and also the length of their flight window can actually be related to their hosts. So the bird cherry oat aphid or paddy actually has two hosts, um, cereals and, and also um, a woody host, while the grain aphid only has one major host, uh, cereals and grasses. Okay. So when an aphid needs to move between hosts, you'll see more flight and also you'll see higher numbers of aphids because there's a die off when you're moving between uh, hosts. So you need to produce more aphids to compensate okay. for that. Okay. And we have a question in from Scott, which is um, basically, do we know if the KDR gene is present in the bird cherry, of, bird cherry aphid? Um, so we have had a project, just finished a master's project looking at that. And we looked for tolerance and resistance to pyrethroids in a, or paddock from different parts of Ireland. And so far we have not detected resistance to uh, pyrethroids in them, but we will continue monitoring that. Okay, okay. Just another one here. Are the results of the specific aphid testing different to what might have been expected? So for example, is the percentage that did not carry virus or resistance, was that surprising? Um, well, we didn't have an expected percentage because this is the first time we've done this in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, in other countries, it varies. It can be an average of 5% in, in some countries, and then the percentage in the field may be different to the percentage in the trap. So we're starting, they were creating our base level now. So mm -hmm. it, it, we didn't have an expected amount. Okay. And then, Stephen, and just the last one to yourself then, is the testing that is done on the suction towers, is that also going to be done on the field traps? Um, yes, and it's one of the it's one of the reasons that we're trying to streamline the the diagnostics by developing a single assay that we can capture all the information we're after. So okay. basically, this means that we can then increase our testing capacity to cover the the fixed suction towers, the the mobile suction towers, um, the infield traps, but then also the the crop samples. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, Stephen, Louise, thank you very much. Okay. Let's move on to our second talk, which will be presented by BJ Vaskar. Awareness of the growing grassweed problem in Irish tillage systems really came to the fore, as we saw in 2021. And the ECT project, our Enabling Conservation Tillage Project, has been monitoring the incidence of grassweeds and also detailing mitigation measures against the primary grassweeds out there. This morning, VJ will update us on the current situation in regards herbicide resistant grassweeds. Over to you, VJ. Thanks, Ewan. This topic is very important because we have now confirmed herbicide resistant grass weeds in Ireland and resistance cases is expected to increase due to many factors as pointed out here. But I suppose the most important one 
is the over reliance on acks and the als herbicides for grass feed control so moving forward we need to have a good picture on the severity and scale of resistance problem information on effective herbicides and cultural weed control options to fight against evolving grass weed challenges in this presentation i will focus on herbicide resistance in black grass and italian dry grass many of us know black grass is the number one herbicide resistant weed in the uk and in europe mainly due to continuous growing of autumn sown crops earlier sowing of winter cereals use of mintel and black grass biology the combination of cross pollination the ability to produce high seed numbers and low seed dormancy facilitate rapid spread and development of resistance especially to acks and als herbicides in ireland we know there were number of native population in this country for some years in addition to the recent suspected black grass imports through seed or machinery while italian dry grass has a very similar biology to black grass it has developed resistance to acks als and total herbicide glyphosate in ireland italian dry grass is not a serious weed uh, in cereal rotations currently cases are now increasing and in places where the species has been found it is often the most difficult to control so what we did in 2020 we carried out a nationwide grass weed survey across 145 tillage farms with plow and non plow based systems more than 160 different grass weed samples were collected for resistance testing this include 12 suspect black grass populations this shows that uh, one in every 12 farms we surveyed we found black grass the location where the black grass samples were collected uh, is shown on the map and most of them came from one county meat the suspect and sensitive population that then grown in a controlled glass house environment at 2 to 3 leaf stage they were sprayed with recommended feed rate of acc falcon and status ultra and als specifica approximately 20000 plants were tested to identify and confirm resistance so four out of 12 population we tested were resistant to the field rate all the four popul four population were resistant to acc falcon and status ultra additionally three population were resistant to als specifica so now we wanted to look into the levels of resistance in these four populations so we what we did is that we took the four population alongside susceptible population and tested with one of the acc herbicide status ultra at different rate the one highlighted are untreated plants which were which were not exposed to status uh, uh, the the herbicide uh, rate increases as you move from right to left up as we move from 0.25 uh, to the recommended field rate the susceptible population was totally killed but the control in four resistant population were inadequate even eight times the recommended field rate of status ultra the control was insufficient this confirms that the four population were acc resistant the same population when tested with the als specifica at different uh, rates the one highlighted are are untreated plants which were not exposed to specifica by the time you reach the recommended field rate the susceptible population and uh, acc resistant only population collected from cock were totally killed but there is not much difference between the treated and untreated in the other three populations even increasing the concentration to eight times the recommended field rate uh, one of the population in meat had very little effect while other two population had few survivors this confirms that these three population were additionally als resistant so now what are the options available to control these three populations will glyphosate be effective to answer this question we took the four population alongside susceptible population and tested with the glyphosate at different rates uh, we used 360 g per liter glyphosate product and the recommended rate used is the recommended rate used on stubble for annual grass weed control this rate might vary if you have uh, problems with scutch or perennial uh, uh, broadleaf uh, weeds 
and of course there is a maximum rate of three to four liters uh, that can be used in a single growing season nevertheless we used 1.5 liter per hectare as a recommended field data in this study as you can see uh, all the four population when tested with the recommended field data had few survivors interestingly the susceptible population also had some survivors this shows that uh, the recommended field rate even when applied at two to three leaf stage and perfect growing condition may, did not offer above 95 percent control uh, uh, whether it is sensitive or resistant black grass but i suppose uh, most of the growers will be using three liters per hectare which gave total control uh, whether resistant or susceptible black grass populations so what are the options available to eliminate a resistant black grass when it comes to black grass a zero tolerance approach is essential uh, for controlling ACKs resistant only population you have seen the likes of uh, pacifica or monolith would be very effective the current advice in the uk is to combine pre-emergence herbicide the likes of firebird or uh, defy or avadax in winter cereals when it comes to winter oil seed rape product like curb uh, in combination with the cultural integrated weed management tactics like uh, spring cropping delayed drilling uh, and growing or uh, increasing the seed rate would be uh, would be effective in eliminating uh, uh, ACKs resistant only population but for population which are resistant to both ACKs and the ALS uh, UK experience shows that uh, uh, herbicide mixture or rotation or even cultural integrated weed management have very little effect uh, uh, where this type of resistant population is widespread in field uh, that particular field should not be in tillage for minimum of five years where glyphosate is used uh, a rate uh, I, uh, above 1.5 liters per hectare is essential uh, to get a good control so now let's move to italian ryegrass in the same survey we collected uh, eight suspect population uh, uh, the location where the samples came from is shown on the map uh, uh, the sensitive uh, population uh, along with the suspect population that are grown in a controlled glasshouse environment at two to three leaf stage they were sprayed with the three ack herbicide axial falcon and stratus ultra and two als herbicides pacifica and broadway star approximately fifteen thousand plants were tested to confirm resistance so four out of eight population uh, were resistant to the field data all the four population were resistant to both the ALS herbicides, Pacifica and Broadway Star. Additionally, the population from Cork were resistant to Axial and Falcon, and the population from uh, one of the population from Meath were resistant only to Axial. But all four population were susceptible to Stratus Ultra. So now to study the levels of resistance, we took the four population alongside susceptible population and tested with the ALS Pacifica at different rates. The one highlighted are the plants which are not treated with the Pacifica. As the, as the rate increased from 0.25 to the recommended field rate, the susceptible population was completely controlled, but the control in other four population was insufficient. Even increasing the concentration to eight times the recommended field rate did not provide a satisfactory control. This shows that all four, four population were ALS resistant. The same population when tested with the uh, uh, AC case axial at different rate. The one uh, highlighted uh, are the untreated plants which were not exposed to axial. By the time you reach the recommended field rate, the susceptible population and one of the population from meat and tip uh, were totally controlled. But the other two population survived axial. Even eight times the recommended field rate, uh, there were few plants, uh, uh, particularly in population cock, surviving uh, the rate, uh, eight times the recommended field rate. Uh, this shows that uh, these two population were additionally resistant to axial. Perhaps this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this figure doesn't need explanation because it, it's very clear that when, uh, uh, when uh, all, the po all four population were treated with the ACK status ultra, the recommended field data uh, totally uh, gave control. Uh, this, uh, this research work demonstrated the, the difficulty in predicting cross resistance and the importance uh, to uh, uh, uh importance to uh, importance of uh, pro protecting chemistry through integrated weed management tactics uh, anyways the the uh, the options to eliminate uh, italian ryegrass is is a very, a very similar to uh, to what we discussed uh, with the black grass for als only resist resistant only population you have the options of uh, uh, ACKs axial falcon or status ultra 
the combination of pre-emergence and cultural integrated weed management tactics would be effective in controlling the AL, uh, ALS resistant population. For ALS and ACK resistant population, uh, for now, status ultra at field rate seems to be effective, but uh, it, uh, but it, it, it doesn't look like a long-term uh, sustainable solution because Italian ryegrass has the cap capability to develop uh, resistance rapidly. And when we tested uh, all four population with the glyphosate, uh, uh, with the recommended field rate of 1.5 liter per hectare, it was totally killed. So I will briefly touch upon the resistance status in other species. Uh, for spring wild oats, we found uh, resistance to ACK herbicide, mostly to axial and falcon, and very rarely to status ultra. But ALS specifica or Broadway star, half or full, were found to be totally effective. Uh, bromes, we are seeing more cases of uh, uh, in, uh, tolerance in uh, to ALS specifica due to the use of a uh, low herbicide rate, but no full herbicide resistant brome has been detected. Uh, uh, ACK's falcon or Broadway uh, half or full rates were found to be highly effective. For canary grass, uh, no herbicides claim control of uh, lesser canary grass, but uh, axial and Pacifica both half and full seems to be effective on all the test, uh, all, the, all the population tested. So the concluding remark is uh, the grass weed problems are, are increasing in fields where herbicide is used as a sole weed control option, resistance will develop. And the frightening fact is it will develop within three to four years if you have a, a cross-pollinating species like black grass and Italian ryegrass. So the key take-home message is the need for increased vigilance, get your samples tested and use all the tools, uh, cultural, non-chemical and herbicide to avoid uh, high seed return and in the process uh, to prevent or delay resistance development. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, so we just have time for, for uh, a few quick questions. And obviously for everybody watching in, please, if you have any questions or queries, please send them in through the, the questions uh, Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So Vijay, I suppose from the data you're showing there, one of the things that strikes me is uh, you mentioned obviously the occurrence of resistance in some of the populations, but how many years does it take before herbicide resistance could start to emerge? Uh, even it depends on uh, the herbicide type, the frequency of use, and the weed species involved. But uh, the, the existing herbicide, the ACKs and the ALS uh, modes of action uh, pose a maximum risk. So uh, if, if, uh, if they are used continuously without uh, integrated weed management, the resistance will develop within three to four years, especially in uh, cross-pollinating species like uh, black grass and uh, Italian ryegrass. Okay, okay. So Vincent is, wants to know, does cutting the recommended rate of herbicide help build resistance? It does. Mm. Because, so uh, the, the problem is that uh, when the herbicides are applied, uh, the recommended herbicides at recommended rates are applied at correct plant growth stage, it causes high mortality. But when you cut the rates, uh, uh, it could leads to poor weed control and subsequently resistance development. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, obviously, I, I know you're working, doing a lot of work on the, the, the modes of resistance or the mechanisms that are, are ongoing in resistance. Can you briefly tell us maybe what, what you found in regard to the mechanisms of resistance that's driving the occurrence of it? Yeah, we did a detailed study uh, last year. So for the black grass, uh, we have confirmed uh, a single and uh, stacked resistance mechanism. When I say stacked, uh, it has uh, ALS and ACK's target site resistance within the, within the single field population. And in Italian ryegrass, we recently confirmed non-target site resistance in one of our population and a combination of uh, target site and non-target site uh, resistance in one in other population. So uh, non-target site uh, resistance is perhaps a serious threat because it, uh, it, it, it affects uh, uh, herbicide uh, with the different modes of action and, and limits uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, options available. So okay. I, I think uh, the, the, we need to uh, prevent a TSR and NTSR uh, development. Okay, okay, it's definitely a complex situation. Well, Vijay, thank you for the contribution this morning. So now we have a series of snapshot presentations delivered by three of our PhD Watch Scholars. Presently, we have 27 Watch Scholars at various stages of their PhD, and the work they do is really critical for our program as it delivers important outputs to assist not just the tillage sector, but indeed several other sectors too. So this morning we have Diana Bukur, Jack Jemison, and Elena Busu giving us a short insight into their work. And first up is Diana, and the title of her talk is Light Leaf Spot of Brassicas, Fungicide Sensitivity Screening and Mechanisms of Resistance. So over to you, Diana. 
Thank you, Yiwon. Lightly spot disease of brassica is produced by the fungal pathogen Pyrenopesiza brassicae, a major concern for the growers of oil seed rape and other uh, vegetable brassica, such as uh, Brussels sprout, cauliflower, cabbages, or um, uh, broccolis. The disease is favored by uh, mild winters, high rainfall throughout the year, cool summers, and limited fluctuations in temperature and uh, can damage flowering with a percentage of a 50 percentage uh, potential if lo yield loss if left untreated. The pathogen um, can, is able to reproduce both sexually and asexually, which leads to high uh, genetic diversity. And because it is still poorly understood and it is not known if the current control strategies are the best, the aim of my project is to establish the fungicide sensitivity status for the Pibrasica populations in, uh, in Ireland. So what, uh, what we were trying to do is um, that uh, we collected over 600 isolates uh, during 2019 and 2020 from uh, diseased uh, uh, oil seed rape leaves presenting characteristic symptoms from light for light leaf spot. These were collected each year from 20 locations representing commercial oil seed rape uh, fields all over Ireland. And the isolates obtained were used in the sensitivity screening in vitro using a micro titer 96 well plate. In this experiment, we aim to quantify the fungal growth of different strains in different concentrations of fungicides from the lowest concentration on the left to the highest concentrations of fungicides on the right. And uh, to establish the EC50 value, which is the concentration of fungicide producing 50% uh, of the maximum effect. The results uh, were confirmed in a glass house uh, experiment where plants treated with different doses of fungicides uh, were infected and the uh, symptoms were uh, assessed. And uh, additionally, DNA was extracted from the isolates and the uh, molecular mechanisms were used, uh, molecular techniques were used to establish the molecular mechanisms involved in the resistance to fungicides. So what did we discover from these experiments? First of all, when uh, prothioconazole dystyo sensitivity was tested in vitro, the free, um, the, we analyzed three populations representing the representative collection for Ireland, Cork, Carlow, and Louth. And uh, we ranked uh, them based on their EC50 value from the lowest to the highest. Um, and um, compared to the wild type uh, control uh, isolate uh, which was sensitive, uh, their values were much higher, which suggests a shift towards decreased sensitivity to prothiodistyo for the isolates in Ireland. Additionally, the um, uh, statistic analysis showed that there are no differences between the three loc locations assessed. A selection of the isolates tested in vitro were selected for further analysis in the glasshouse experiments, and they were ranked from the most sensitive to insensitive and they were used to infect the plants treated with different doses of proline. As observed uh, from the graph uh, for the full dose of fungicides, no differences were observed uh, for uh, the isolates tested when compared to the wild type sensitive isolate, which suggests that when used to spray the plants, the fungicides are still highly efficient against light leaf spot. Using molecular techniques, we were able to identify four types of inserts and two mutations within the gene targeted by the azole fungicides. And combinations of these alterations led to 16 genotypes of resistance to azoles. This could be grouped from the most sensitive, which contain uh, uh, isolates without any type of alteration, to the most uh, resistant isolates, which presented both mutations and the type of insert. Looking at the sensitive uh, fungal isolates, only eight were present for the whole collection, while uh, most of the isolate presented at least the mechanisms of resistance. The most predominant group of isolates presented the mutation G460S uh, along with a uh, type of insert, and this combination was previously uh, known to cause a strong decrease in sensitivity. These results are showing that although the fungicides are efficient in controlling the disease in the glasshouse experiment, the molecular resistance uh, mechanisms are present and uh, therefore the resistance could develop in time if measures are not taken. To conclude, uh, our sensitivity experiments reveal the shift towards decreased sensitivity to azoles in the lab, while no change in fungicides efficacy was observed in the glasshouse trials. 
Uh, however, as uh, CYP51 genotypes of resistance are uh, present uh, within the population and the development of resistance will potentially become a problem in the future, our results support the use of azole in a combination with a QOY or SDHI mixing partner to control the disease and decrease the risk of resistance uh, with continuous sensitivity monitoring aimed to ensure optimal strategies are deployed. I would like to thank my supervisors and partners. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, next, we have Jack, whose title is Performance of Crop Establishment Systems on Irish Farms and Farmers' Perceptions. Over to you, Jack. Hello, everybody. So without further ado, we'll get into it. So why is there a need for this work? So there are many reasons, but the two main reasons are, number one, there has been a substantial increase in interest and uptake of these systems in recent years. And number two, Irish growers are currently dependent on research that was conducted in conditions or climates that are quite different from our own, which is probably not the most ideal scenario, as some of this research may not be relevant in our conditions. Also, there is a raft of concerns about the impact of climate on system performance in terms of soils, their organic matters, their structures, their fertilities, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as disease and weed control and crop performance and sustainability, both economic and environmental. Okay, so my research can be broken up into three main components. The first being the focus study. It consists of 21 farms, seven plough, seven min till and seven no till. These are all located within 60 kilometers of Oak Park and are a mix of light, medium and heavy soils. The second component is a small plot trial and there are plough, min till and no till plots with four replications of each system. The replicated nature of this trial is an advantage as data collected can be easily analyzed using conventional methods. These plots are located at Chagas Knockbeg trial site, which I'm sure some of the people listening would be familiar with. So for both the focus study and the small plot trial, I am looking at crops of first winter wheat, and I am monitoring crop establishment, growth, yield components, management practices, as well as economic and environmental sustainability. And last but not least, the third component is the farmer perception study. This study is nearing completion and is being conducted via a detailed phone survey. The aim of the study is to speak to over 140 Irish tillage farmers who have more than 50 hectares of tillage. The survey will be done with a mix of plough, min till, strip till and no till farmers. It will assess farmers sources of information and how they interact with this information. And it will also investigate farmers views on how the different crop establishment systems perform. The questions center around how the systems perform in terms of yield, nutrition, soils, disease control, weed control, etc. Okay, so I'll just very quickly run through some of the preliminary results from my first year. First, we'll have a quick look at the plant counts from the focus study featuring the 21 farms. Now, it is generally expected that non plough systems will have lower plant counts than that of plough based systems. As you can see here, it is quite the contrary. All three systems achieved satisfactory plant counts with no-till coming in with the highest of the three systems. Um, now, we think this is a function of both higher seeding rates and generally earlier sowing dates on the no-till farms, but we plan to look more closely into this in time. The second parameter we will look at is phi power. This is a measure of how much light a canopy is intercepting. It is an indication of the amount of plant growth that has occurred and the resulting canopy size. So it is a good parameter to look at when trying to study the growth habit of a crop. You can see in front of you five power values at the different crop growth stages for the three systems. It is obvious from the graph that the different systems seem to have crops that are slightly more advanced at different stages, but it's important to note that at growth stage 37, when the flag leaf has just become visible, that there is very little difference amongst the systems. The final results we will look at will be yields. For comparison purposes, I put the focus study yields and the yields from the small plot trial side by side. As you can see, the yields for plough and min till were very similar, and the yields for no till were slightly lower than that of the other systems. It is important to note, though, that there is an indication that no till farmers could be spending less on inputs overall. So we plan to look at what impact this could have on margin in time. Also, when you look at the yields for the small plot trial in Knockbeg, where the management for each system was identical, there was no statistical difference in yield between the three systems. Also, it's important to note that th these are results from only one year of data collection, 
but that very respectable yields were obtained by all three systems. Finally, what impact will this work have upon completion? So the research work conducted as part of the focus study and the small plot trial will generate detailed system performance information. This, inf this simultaneous collection of data via both the focus study and the small plot trial will allow useful comparisons to be made and will give a decent insight into what is actually going on on farms. It will also create better information for system change decisions to be based upon. And the results of the farmer perception study will indicate the sources of growers information, how they access that information, what their perceptions about these systems are, where knowledge gaps are located, and it will also allow us to better allocate limited research resources. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd also like to thank my supervisors, Dermot Forrestal from Chagas and Professor Kevin MacDonald from UCD for their guidance so far. So back to you, Ewan. Thank you, Jack. So last up is Elena. And the title of Elena's work is Investigating the Plant Biostimulant Activity of Soil Bacteria. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Ewan. Why are we working on this? Current and future limitations of crop production include the need for increased climate resilience, EU regulations on the use of plant protection products, and the ambitious farm to four goals for 2030. In this context, what does a biostimulant does? Well, the term is still ambiguous, but the most recent definition says that it represents subst substances and or microorganisms whose function is to stimulate natural processes to benefit nutrient uptake, nutrient efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stresses, and benefit overall crop quality. Under this definition, biostimulants are, have the potential to maintain or even improve yield under stressful conditions, to reduce the, the reliance on intensive inputs, and represent new tools to support integrated pest management practices. There are two main groups of biostimulants, microbials and non-microbials. Some, some soil bacteria have the potential to improve plant growth, acting as biocontrol agents. And when they are applied to the plant, they activate uh, defense responses and induce resistance against pathogens. And they also can act as biofertilizers, facilitating nutrient acquisition. Uh, for my PhD project, the focus is uh, relaying on characterizing the impact of a novel bacterium, OP14, in uh, the development of uh, plants. And for that, I want to present you a few preliminary data. In order to study the impact at early stages of the plant development, I coated oilseed rape seeds with solutions presenting or not OP14. And then I observed uh, their development uh, by taking scores of shoot and root length and germination rate and calculating vigor index. We can observe on the graph that when uh, the seeds were previously coated with water or media control, an average of the vigor index value is around 500. But when the seeds were pre-treated with OP14, the vigor index value increases to um, average increases to 750, which is about 50% higher than the controls. This can be also observed in the image where water in media control treated uh, seedlings are less developed than OP14 uh, seedlings. Similar results have been um, obtained for winter wheat cultivar Rockefeller, where again we can see an improvement in the vigor index value with about 50%. And this can also be uh, observed in the picture on the bottom uh, right. Trying to understand how uh, OP14 impacts plant um, at early stages of development, I uh, built rhizoboxes to study the root development in real time and observed that OP14 has the ability to promote root establishment. It can be noticed in the image that for oil seed rape, uh, the roots are deeper and also they uh, uh, are more dense, indicating a richer root uh, structure. 
For uh, winter wheat cultivar Rockefeller, we can see the a higher density in the um, shallow roots. And even though we don't see um, a difference in the length of the deeper roots, we can observe that OP14 treated plants develop thicker roots with more hairs. Why is root architecture important in crop yield? Well, biologically, uh, roots can be uh, defined as shallow and deeper roots. Shallow roots are better at capturing uh, immobile nutrients, which are usually present only in topsoil, while deeper roots are able to capture water and mobile nutrients that in drought condition, for example, will be available at more, more depth. At the moment, ongoing experiments are looking at the impact OP14 has on later stages of plant development. In conclusion, the role of biostimulants is in tillage system is becoming more prominent and potential is being continuously developed. From our project's pers perspective, uh, we will continue to collate uh, data on the influence of OP14 on the yield parameters of oilseed rape and winter wheat. Next stages of this work involve studying more crop species and also studying the potential of OP14 to increase stress resilience under infield condition. Thank you very much for your attention and for uh, and I would like, would like also to thank my supervisors for their continuous support and the World Scholarship Program for the funding of this project. Thank you, Elena and uh, Diana and Jack also. And I'd like to invite the three of you now, please, just to turn on your cameras so we can get through some of the questions that have that have come in uh, into us here. Jack, from your results from the focus study that you had there, you concentrated on yields for obvious reasons. Um, but do you know or how are you going to find out what impact all of this has on overall profitability on each system, which ultimately is key? OK, so um, I'll deal with the first part of the question, first of all. So, no, we don't currently know what impact these yields will have on overall system profitability, but we do intend to investigate this. Um, the approach we'll probably take is to apply standard cost to all inputs applied. Um, similar to the ones contained in the Chagas Costs and Returns booklet. Um, I'm currently collecting the last of this information. So um, once all this management information has been collated, we'll, we'll start to look at that and we'll hopefully have answers soon. Okay, and just it's just something I, I thought you said, you, you mentioned that inputs may be lower out on the no-till farms, but I think you mentioned that in the knockback trial, all the inputs are identical for the three systems. So maybe you can explain that, please. Um, yeah, so that's correct. And um, the inputs and management used for all three systems in the knock bag trial were the same. Um, we did this as the goal of the trial was to try and sort of discern what impact the establishment system has on crop performance um, mm -hmm. rather than how the system interacts with the inputs used. So I suppose the best way to do this was to try and reduce the amount of variation in the trial and the only and only to vary the factor we were interested uh, in sort of measuring the impact of. So this was the cultivation system. So um, if we try and vary the input levels as well on the no-till plots, for example, it would be very difficult to isolate sort of um, whether, it would be, whether it would be the cultivation system yeah. um, or, or the differing input levels causing the effect yeah, versus the other that. treatments. Yeah. Yeah, so. out the detail. yeah, absolutely. So Deanna, you gave some interesting insights on light leaf spot there, and obviously a disease that we don't know maybe as much as we should know about in terms of epidemiology. And we've seen in the last two years, obviously, the more we know about a disease, the more we're able to, to manage it. But I suppose one of the things that, that strikes us from your, your work is how do the results from the glass house translate or are relevant for what is happening in the field? From what we noticed from the glasshouse results, uh, the fungicides are still highly efficient against lightly spot in the mm -hmm. glasshouse, but uh, those are fully controlled uh, conditions. It's really easy to know if the disease is there. We sprayed the, the fungicides uh, preventively, so there mm -hmm. was no disease at the time we applied the fungicides. So obviously it was really easy to control the disease, but um, mm -hmm. in the field, the situation is a bit more complicated. We don't know exactly when the disease starts and usually when we spot it in the field it's already uh, the advanced uh, stage of epidemics so i would say it's more complicated and uh, we cannot rely on the results from the glass house because obviously just because in the glass house uh, the fungicides were highly efficient this doesn't mean that in the field the case would be the same so yeah. it would be really important to monitor the disease 
Yeah, exactly. So the, the glass house gives us insight, but obviously, as you said, ultimately the, the work needs to be done, needs yeah. to be done out in the field. So in regards to applying fungicides in the field, when should they be applied? Can you give <laughs> some detail? The short answer would be as soon as possible. At the mm. moment, uh, for instance, for this year, uh, we didn't spot a uh, lightly spot in the field yet, but uh, mm. soon it will be there. And uh, as I was saying, it's really important to continuously monitor the crops. So sometimes yeah. uh, this doesn't only mean uh, just to go there and see if it's in the field because sometimes this is already late and the best uh, would be just to Take some leaves, put them in a the bag and look for the sporulation to see if the disease is there, then it is very time good. to. Yeah, OK, a very simple way to, to see what's out there. And I guess I suppose the take home message is that your molecular analysis shows that, as you said, the population is dynamic and that there are changes happening in regards yes. to the potential yes. fungicide insensitivity, which is something we wouldn't want to see, but it's something we need to be fully aware of. So uh, Elena, so biostimulants, we heard Pete Berry at the webinar last week mention our talk about biostimulants. Um, you presented data for just one variety on spring oilseed rape and winter wheat. Have you tested any more varieties or any other species? Uh, yes, um, I'm trying for each species I'm testing to test at least three varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, for oilseed rape, I tested another spring variety for which the seed was really old and we've seen similar improvements in seed development. Uh, and also a winter variety for which, again, we've seen positive results in the improving vigor index. Okay. For wheat, I uh, tested another two varieties and uh, uh, we again see a positive impact on uh, seed development, maybe not as high as uh, with the cultivar Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to other species, um, I tested uh, barley so far and uh, we don't see any differences uh, given by the treatment in vitro conditions. Vitro conditions, yeah, and I guess yeah, it's just following on from Diana's comment, obviously, the, we have to get it out to the field to evaluate. And do you have any plans to evaluate uh, in the field? Uh, yes, uh, we are planning at the moment for some field trials on uh, spring cereal crops and spring oilseed rape. Okay. And um, yeah, for that, I would like to remind everybody uh, what Pete suggested last week that uh, if you want to try work, um, um, working with biostimulants, maybe the best solution is to try it first. And he was suggesting to try it uh, in your fields with uh, test stripes with where uh, biostimulant treated uh, plants are and in between untreated plants. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a couple of tram lines just to try it out. Very good. Okay, well, thank you all three of you for your contributions. So for our last presentation this morning, we turn to Stephen Kilday. Stephen needs no introduction. As you know, leads our pathology program here in Oak Park. This morning, Stephen will give us an update on serial disease control for 2022. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Ewan. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Ewan says, I, I'll give a uh, I suppose an overview of a number of different things this morning uh, relating to serial disease control for the, the coming year. Uh, just to give a quick overview of what I'll talk about. Look, I know there is a lot of discussion about the cost of fertilizer and potential reductions in, 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 in fertilization this year. I know uh, the previous uh, the, the, the presentations two weeks ago give a good overview of what that might mean um, in terms of reductions. So we might uh, address some of that or look at some of the data that we would have generated a couple of years ago on septoria control. Um, there has been, I suppose, a bit of discussion over the last number of years on the role of micronutrients and potentially they may have in septoria control. So we'll highlight some data that we generated also. And of course, look, we're, we're now into our second year, our second year of post-CTL. So I think it's, uh, I suppose, it's relevant to, I suppose, look at some of the data that we have for, I suppose, wheat and barley. And we're really talking about ramularia and septoria control in that sort of scenario. So if we, if we just highlight, I suppose, some of what Richie Hackett would have presented uh, two weeks ago in terms of the implications of the cost of fertilizer or end fertilizer um, and the implications, I suppose, of the potential grain prices that are there. Richie sort of highlighted that, look, it's a case on it's, it, it's not a one case fits all sort of our fits all sort of scenarios. But in the general sort of overview of things, given the cost um, of, of the fertilizer and given the, the potential grain price, there could be a reduction or a potential optimum might be a reduction maybe of uh, between 25 and, and 35 uh, kilograms of, of nitrogen. And that sort of brings in a range, if you if you would take the average there, it brings in 
in the range between maybe the low 150, maybe to 225 or, or, or those sort of around about sort of aspects. And the question is then, what does that mean in terms of uh, septoria control? So this is some work that we, we set up a number of years ago as part of a Department of Agriculture Stimulus Fund it project called uh, COSTEM. It was looking at various different things within the project. But one of the, the questions that we did have was that if we're, if we're looking at the, the increase in rates of N, what implications does that have on septoria control? We set out these trials in between 2015 and 2018, and we, we included a range of varieties um, going from Cordial, which is very, very susceptible to septoria, up to Stig and, and Sundance in one of the year, that would be quite resistant, fairly resistant. And um, we had a, a dose response of our, of our uh, end fertilization going from zero up to 300 kilograms per hectare. And we applied these uh, across a, a split, a typical split of uh, 25 uh, percent at growth stage 25, 50 at, at growth stage 32, and the, the remaining 25 at, at growth stage 39. Um, and what we could see from the trials themselves in terms of when we, we let disease develop uh, without any treatments, any fungicide treatments, we could see that, look, there, in each of the years, there was a significant end effect. So basically, when we put on end, we got, we, we got more disease development. There was, of course, also a varietal effect, as you might expect. Uh, and in two, of, in two of the years that it present, 2016, 2018, we actually saw an interaction between the variety and, and the N in terms of the level of septoria. But just to pull out, I suppose, some of what the data looked like in 2016, and uh, we had our three varieties in that year. We had Cordial was very susceptible. JB Diego would have been, a, I suppose, moderately resistant in 2016. It's now quite susceptible. And Stig was the variety that we included as very resistant. And straight away, what you could see, and I suppose it's typical of the other years, was that Cordial, as we increased the N and went up to 300 kilograms per hectare, you can see that we got quite a lot of septoria developing. But as you went down to no end of uh, artificial N applied, you had, you had quite low levels of disease. And, and I suppose similar in the in the, in the 75 uh, kilograms but really in the range that we're sort of talking about and even with the potential reductions that might come in they're, they're relatively small and within that range between the 150 and 225 we see no no differences between um the, the amount of septoria that would be on the susceptible variety it, between 150 and 25, no difference. Also on JB Diego no difference of course look stig in itself even at the very high level of, of n doesn't have a huge amount of disease there anyhow. Um, but one, one thing to, I suppose, to, to note is that the question might be, why is this N actually doing that to start with? And we do know that, look, there may be some in, or some direct relationship between septoria and N, but there's also a whole aspect of canopy architecture that, look, when we get to that zero N, we, we've lost a lot of tillers by the time it comes to grain filling. It's a very open canopy. It could be a lot more difficult for, for those spores to be splashing around at that stage. Um, and this... We can see very clearly in some of the photographs in, in this sort of scenario, as you can see, look, you, you would know the, 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 the plots here that have that low end. Um, they are, I suppose, they aren't as dense. You, you, there is less disease there, but they are most definitely they aren't uh, as heavy or as dense. And what you can see between the, the 150 and the 225, there's very, very little difference in, in, in what's there. So really, we would, to be looking at N and, and trying to reduce it from a septory point of view, we would need to be uh, having a very significant sort of reduction in the amount of N to, um, to, to reduce what we can actually do from a septoria point of view. And of course, such significant reductions will have uh, major impacts on yield. So really where we're looking at optimizing that aspect of yield, there isn't a huge amount of impact on the amount of septoria that would be there. This then leads us through, I suppose, to the second part of the, the presentation, which will be the role of the micronutrients. Um, and also under the, the cost end project, we set up a range of trials between 2014 and 2016. Uh, again, on susceptible variety, uh, I think it ranged from uh, the time Cordial and Einstein. Um, I think also we had done, uh, done more was included at the, in, in the trial site, one of the trial sites. We tested eight micronutrients. These were foliar uh, applications and we, we basically applied them at their, the recommended rates that would be on the products at, at flag leaf emergence of full flag leaf emergence and prior to this no uh, disease control strategy would have been put in place so this was this was really a test of disease control in, in these sort of plots and um, all other management strategies in, in the crop would have been exactly the same as would be in, in a normal crop 
Um, and what we could see from the disease levels was that we, we can achieve some level of disease control. There are only moderate levels of disease control, but only for certain uh, micronutrients. And, and the ones that stood out there are going to be your, your boron, your, your manganese, uh, sulfur. And I should say that the sulfur that we would have applied is an ele elemental sulfur uh, and also zinc. But when we looked then through into what's coming into the combine at the very end, it was only actually the boron and, and sulfur that provided a significant yield benefit over the untreated. Now, the one thing I would highlight in, in in this yield benefit is that it's a relatively small yield benefit compared to what you would be expecting from the fungicide and in this scenario we know that we would have been applying a fungicide here at the growth stage 39 we'd be expecting to get over a ton maybe a ton and a half while in the the best we were achieving from the micronutrients was about 0 0.6 0 0.7 of a ton so there is some some aspects some level of disease control that can be achieved but it is limited to some of those micronutrients and i would be looking i suppose mostly at that sulfur and boron um, and sulfur, look, it, it, it doesn't necessarily come as a surprise and sulfur has been or is regarded as a, as a fungicide, um, which leads us then, I suppose, into the alternatives for, for, chlor, uh, for chlorothanolin. Um, and the sulfur aspect is one that we will have, we have looked at or have included. Um, and what I'm highlighting here is just that it's one of some of the data that's coming from a trial series that we're looking at. Um, in terms of what multi-sites do we, we look at or, or recommend in, into the future. Um, the trial is uh, it's sort of looking across three varieties. We've, we've chosen Costello probably as our, our, when we started this work was moderately resistant, moderately susceptible. Uh, KWXT is, is at, I suppose it's a low level or moderately resistant in, in the Irish scenario. It's, it's, it's quite good across the water in England, but from an Irish perspective, it's only got moderate septory resistance. And JB Diego was our susceptible control. And we applied, I suppose, uh, at the time when the, start the trial started, we were looking at an azole SDHI, which would have been, a, the program would have been a lattice era followed by Librex at 80% rate of each. And then for the reference point, look, we have included chlorothanol here and uh, to give us an idea what, what level of control we should be trying to achieve. I suppose to start off with, in terms of the, the fungicide program without the multi-site, we can see what we have lost in terms of efficacy from the SDHI and the azoles. Um, because previously we would have been expecting very, very good control here. And here we're below four, we're below 50% control from that program. Clearly, when we add in that multi-site, we do get a very good control. And look, we can see what chlorothanol would have brought, but equally we can see that fulpit, manca zebra sulfur, all brings a significant level of disease control. So a significant improvement in the in, in disease control coming from those. And this, of course, transfers through also into yield. What we can see is that we get a significant benefit from the multi-sites. The chlorothanol did set that benchmark, um, but you can see that whether it's fulpit, uh, mangazard or sulfur, um, we do get that high, uh, we do get a, an increase in the, in the yield. Now, what I would say is, look, the question might be, what have we lost from the chlorothanol to those other multi-sites? And one thing I would say is that, look, in, in, these, in this sort of high pressure scenario that would have been Cork 2021, we wouldn't necessarily be recommending that type of an ASOL SDHI program. We would be recommending some of the neurochemistry in the form of Inatrec or in Revisol. And we would expect that actually their, their, their inclusion there with that multi-site would bring us back up to what we would have, uh, what we potentially have lost from chlorothalin. So we can achieve that disease control um, in, 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 I suppose, carefully designed strategies at, at the moment. One thing I should also say within the trials is that we, we don't see an interaction between the varieties uh, and, the, and the control program. So they seem to be performing similarly across the different varieties. And um, similar trials conducted in Oak Park, we see similar, uh, almost identical levels of disease control being achieved and, and just a visual representation of what we're seeing there. So you can see, I suppose, what we've lost from the STHI ASOs that we used in, in the program, but clearly the addition of that multi-site bringing a, 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 an increase in terms of uh, disease control. And this, this sort of uh, instance here, it, it's fulpit that we're looking at. Um, I suppose the other question then, look, chlorothalin was a key component of, of barley. Um, and just uh, to give a visual representation, I don't really have a, a huge amount of time to get into the, the trial details and specifics. But what we have been seeing in, I suppose, consistently since 2019 is that, look, we've, we've, we have had some very bad Ramularia epidemics in, in the untreated plots. 
Um, even where we have an application or a cover spray at stem extension, as you can see on the left hand side, we still do get some very, very high levels of, of, of ramularia if we don't put a, a management strategy or a strategy a fungicide on at, at those ons emerging. But what we do see is that even in, in the presence of, of a high level of resistance to the azoles in the population, we do see that proline can give some moderate disease control. We see that fulpit also gives some moderate levels of disease control and combining these together, we, we can manage the disease. And I suppose also then, look, we have also have Rev uh, the Revisol or in, in the form of Revistar here. Um, and we do know that, look, the Revisol component of that is given some very good disease control too. So what I would say is that it, it is a, in the a scenario that we we can manage the Ramularia post-CTL. It's, it's a case of where I say we can, we can manage it. We probably won't have crops that are completely uh, clean of, of Romularia, but I think what we need to do is try and protect that key period of grain filling uh, post anthesis. Um, and, and after that point, um, after a few weeks there, that look, Romularia will come into the crop. But if we've, if we've been able to maximize that period or and manage that period effectively, that the impact on yield won't be as great as, as we would, uh, would, would expect. So it is a case of actually looking at what we currently have here, your problem with proline and fulpit. As I said, they're providing moderate levels of disease control combined together. It is, it's improved. And of course, then the other, the, the other one that is available at the moment is, is Revisol in the form uh, of, of Revistar. So that is really a very a quick summary of a number of different things. But look, in terms of the aspect of, of nitrogen, look, we do know that uh, as we increase N, it will increase uh, septoria levels. But it's really within that range that we're looking to try and optimize yield. Um, and in terms of the economic returns, et cetera, there's very little scope to actually alter the disease control programs for septoria control. And uh, I think based on what the data from the trials would be so, sort of suggesting. Of the micronutrients that we tested, sulfur and boron provided the most consistent control. I think, look, it's no surprise that sulfur would be there. It is, I suppose, traditionally uh, uh, a fungicide. What I would say is that it is that elemental form that we have looked at. The boron is one that we're not fully, I suppose, 100% sure why that necessarily would be providing it. But I think the trials were designed in such a manner that we were looking very much at disease control and it may not necessarily have been purely from a nutritional aspect or it, i'd say it was probably a direct inhibition of the of the septoria and multi-sites look we can see that uh, the multi-sites are continually will continue to be important not just from a resistance management perspective but i think from a disease control uh, and maintaining yield it, they are important and um, as i said look there was a number of options there we used the fulpit mancozeb and sulfur and um, look, the, the, I suppose the best or the most easiest option at the moment probably will be will be fulpit, the most widely available. And um, but the others actually are available also. And, and well, Mancozeb, I think, probably is not. But the, there are various op options for sulfur. And from our trials, look, we'd see that actually it is also providing um, some decent levels of disease control in, in terms of returning to yield also. Um, and as I say there at the very last, look, Romularia is manageable, um, but it is about timing and it is about product choice that these things are critical. Uh, and I think what I showed there was probably those products that are going to be providing the most control um, of everything that's probably available. Um, and it's, an, it's a key, a key importance that not only is the, those, those type of products looked at, but also the, the, the timing is, is critical. And that really is about that ons emerging, because as I say, we're trying to maximize a window of disease control that is going to follow post anthesis. And, and really we have to do it at that stage to make sure that the ramularia isn't developing in that leaf that actually once it hits anthesis, that those stresses sort of manifest themselves in terms of the disease. Um, so with that, look, what uh, just uh, the thank, uh, I suppose, the, the trials teams that we would have here, Deirdre, Liam and, and Fiona and Jim. And also then, look, a lot of the work I presented was part of the cost them. Um, and that would have been uh, Dr. Hilda Dooley um, and Dr. Raj, uh, Dr. Raj uh, Rathor. I suppose one final thing is to say, look, we, we a lot of the trials that we've been conducting, we have to, we do them off site. And, and I'd just like to thank the farmers for access to the fields, etc. And, and at this stage, look, uh, a lot of the trials that we have conducted in Cork, uh, thankful to uh, Stephen and Anthony Collins who provided us access there for a good 10 years so uh, thank you very much. Okay thank you Stephen. Um, uh, I'd like all presenters now to just turn on their cameras so we have for the Q&A session but Stephen just a couple of questions I suppose on, on what you were talking about there first so just to clarify do the multi-sites still have a role when using the new chemistries? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I think it's it's almost a, a dual role where I suppose maybe four or five years ago we were always talking about resistance management. That's still critical. These molecules that are out with that inner track or be it in Revisol do need to be protected. 
Um, but I also see it as important, and I think the graph that I would have presented, it's important from a disease control and yield maintenance, and that if, if these molecules were to develop resistance, that we still have a, a means of, I suppose, uh, limiting the impact that that might have on in terms of disease control and yield. Okay, so look, not surprisingly, there's a couple of questions in on sulfur. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll shoot a few of these at you. Um, basically, will the same activity be seen from sulfur if it was applied as a compound? Uh, I think probably not in, in this sort of scenario. We were looking at this very from much a uh, fungicidal aspect. Uh, and I think elemental sulfur has been regarded as, as, as having that fungicide component at okay. that stage. So, Okay. And will the sulfur add anything for nutrition, do you think? Uh, from an ele elemental side, it might necessarily be take a bit more time to actually break down to so that it's readily available from the, the plant's perspective. Okay, and there's a question in, are the micronutrients being used to promote plant health or to actually kill the pathogen? I think in this scenario, we designed this from the aspect of um, very much a, a disease control specifically. So I don't think it's coming through from your nutritional, uh, maybe a small amount of it, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of it is probably coming through from direct inhibition. Okay, and what rates of sulfur? Uh, a specific question, because there obviously is... As you showed on the graph, there was no difference between sulfur and, and pulpit. Yeah, so in, 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 the, in the sulfur that we use, look, we will say it was headland sulfur. We used the, the full recommended rate. It's 10 litres. It is, I'll be honest, it is a, a difficult one to be putting that amount into a tank. So it is a difficult option. Mm -hmm. There are other sulfurs available. Um, and whether, I suppose the question is whether we can reduce the rates from the recommended or not is something that we, we don't have the data on per se. I do know that when we go, we have looked at the headland sulfur at a, a, a quite a low rate, three to four litres, and it mm. doesn't provide the disease control. So with it, we do need to get okay. up to the higher amount. Okay, very good. Um, I'm going to spread it around a bit now. We, we've questions coming in, which is great. So for Jack, Jack, the, the growers in the no-till system maintain cover crops and rotation, obviously a vital part of the system. Will, this, will your studies capture uh, elements of this or the effects of this? Uh, yeah, so they are vital parts of the system. Um, so to deal with the focus study or the on-farm research first, um, rotation will be taken into account there um, because we're looking at crops of first winter wheat. So they're all after break crops, whether they're on plough, min till or direct drill farms. Um, and we will be recording uh, where cover crops were used and on what farms because, uh, yes, they are being used on no-till farms with some of my other growers, both min till and plough are utilising cover crops as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of knock bag, um, cultivations and rotations are being looked at there together. Uh, Dermot Forrestal has a, a long term trial there where it's been, um, I suppose, I think it's eight years in its current form. But um, some of the plots are going all the way back to 1999. Okay. And um, so, yeah, rotations are being looked at there. But in terms of cover crops in knock bag, um, it would be very difficult to, uh, I suppose, incorporate cover crops into that trial because I suppose you'd have to have um, a vastly higher number of plots um, and I suppose a more complex trial design, which would probably be prohibitive in terms of labour um, and costs and as well as the history that's been built up since uh, 1999 in some of the plots. Um, so it'd take a long time to see the effects of that, I think. Okay, thanks, Jack. And uh, Elena, a question in regards to OP14 um, wasn't touched on, obviously, due to time with your presentation, but... Can you explain, is that applied to the seed directly or was it a drench for the soil or maybe just give us a few details on that, please? Um, okay, uh, yes, it is applied to the seed directly. So uh, depending on the species uh, we are working on and usually the uh, side of the seed, we are uh, preparing inoculum and uh, exposing this, the seed in a solution for a particular uh, time. Um, everything is uh, tested for several um, periods of time and then the best uh, uh, period of time of exposure is selected. Yeah, okay, very good, thank you. So uh, Stephen, is there any varietal resistance available for ramularia that can be relied upon? Yeah, uh, it is, I'm not 100% sure being honest. I, I think there may well be differences in tolerance but I think mm. currently what we're looking at, uh, I think a lot of the varieties are, are getting ramularia, to be honest. And there's going to be a huge environmental lot, uh, sort of interaction going on here also. Okay. Uh, Vijay, for yourself, is there any rapid tests which a grower can use in the field to test for ALS or, or any of the other resistances that you talked about? 
yeah for the for the non target site resistance yes uh, the uh, the newcastle university have uh, recently collab uh, in the uk has collaborated with the mologic they have developed the uh, same like a pregnancy test or a covid antigen test so they can go uh, they can use that test to see if there is any non target site resistance in their population but for uh, target site resistance no okay and uh, a question vj have you found any site with resistant grass weeds present where all species show resistance it's kind of like the the nightmare scenario Uh, we found few cases, especially in uh, wild oat and uh, Italian ryegrass, because of uh, because of uh, of the same herbicide uh, that can be applied to both the grass weeds. Uh, the one is spring germinating, but the other is, uh, of course, autumn germinating. We also found a few cases with the sterile broom and uh, black grass uh, in fields. That's where the rates uh, c- comes into picture. So if you use uh, if where the rates are uh, not uh, where the rates are used below the recommended field rate, the wild oats or the brome started to show tolerance, while the other weeds like uh, black grass and Italian rye grass have developed resistance. So reduced rates are the important uh, IPM measures. But uh, before going for the reduced rate, it is mandatory uh, to to assess the uh, field population. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Louise, just in in your talk, um, you didn't. mention or emphasize too much about decision support systems you talked at the end about it and um, what are your plans around that is there uh, plans for spring barley specifically yeah so we have a new project the aid project uh, where we'll be working with harper adams and adas and we'll be mm-hmm. looking at both winter and spring decision support systems so for the winter one adas has developed one that we're going to trial here and for the spring one we want to develop a new spring model um, mm-hmm. which will be involves those yellow traps I showed uh, we will use them to understand when aphids are flying and landing and spreading virus with the suction tower network to develop a uh, model specifically for spring barley. Very good, excellent. And Stephen, you you gave us kind of a, an insight into what the plans are for 2022 and beyond which is very exciting. But but when you mentioned sequencing and the diversity, what exactly does that tell us? I mean, how is that going to make a difference to to any decision support system or any any program we would develop? Yeah, so at the moment we there's there's no information on um, the strain of BYDV mm. um, that's circulating in Ireland that's uh, in the crops and and in the insects. So we're using the sequencing information to actually confirm what strain of virus is there, and then with that information we can see what strain is in the crop, but then also what strain is in the the insects, whether that's coming from the 12.2 meter suction towers. or from the infield traps so we can connect all the information together that we know what strain is in the insect and then what strain is in the in the actual crop okay great and uh, diana in regard to light leaf spot are you doing any work uh, on more light leaf spot resistant varieties um, and if you are do you think that will have a positive interaction on on slowing down the development of resistance So what I'm doing, I'm also testing uh, other uh, classes of fungicides to see mm-hmm. if uh, maybe mixing uh, different uh, different modes of action would help this. So I'm also looking in, into SDHIQ or WISE, and I also tested the um, uh, MBCs, which are not uh, used anymore. So hopefully this will give more insight. Okay, very good. Um, there's... Uh... One there, Stephen, for yourself, does sulfur that is sprayed on help with end uptake and help in septoria control? Well, we know it does, obviously, the septoria control. But I guess what you're saying, it, it's a direct fungitoxic effect on, on septoria. Yeah, I think in the, the trials that we were looking at, that's what we would have been seeing the effect. I can't answer in terms of the role of impact on, on end uptake. Yeah. yeah, okay. And and one in regards to Prothio, are we... Um, Uh, how best can we manage the use of protio? Obviously, there's is there a risk that we could be overusing it in wheat and barley, and 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 how do we ensure that it's it's longevity? Yeah, look, it has been it's been around now since I suppose mid 2000s and has provided a lot of important disease control. And um, how would we how do we manage it? I think it comes down to putting all the other I suppose starting with the, the measures that reduce the disease pressure, be the the IPM sort of measures, varietal choice, etc. But also then choosing it or reflecting in terms of the disease pressure and the specific diseases that you may be needing to address. And it may look, we can look at the barley perspective and we see that there's a range of different diseases, which are all going to be dependent on the variety that's grown. And we can choose, mix and match the different, I suppose, chemistries that are available. It isn't, we don't have to rely on it solely. Uh, and exactly the same then for septoria control. Look, the addition of Vinitrec and also Revisol last year have provided us with additional measures. 
Okay, great. And Stephen, I'm going to throw the last one at you. I suppose it's a future perspective on the role of breeding techniques, maybe novel breeding techniques in, in trying to deliver BYDV resistance. Um, is much work being done on BYDV resistance in, in, in cereals? And, and obviously, I'm assuming novel breeding techniques can help in that regard. Yeah, so I mean, at the at 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 the moment, we the, we can't really use gene editing. Uh, it's not available to breeders in Europe to use. But I'm sure these tools will be um, hugely important in the future to try and breed more tolerant varieties. Yeah. Um, but one thing we'll be able to use with the platform is to be able to um, monitor new tolerant varieties as they're coming on stream to actually quantify the level of resistance. Yeah, very good, excellent. Okay, look, there's a few more questions coming in there, but. I'm conscious of time. Uh, we said we'd finish up at one o'clock, so we're going to conclude there. So I want to thank all our speakers this morning, uh, Louis, Stephen, Vijay, Diana, Helena, Jack, and Stephen. In the background, Michael Hennessy and Dermot, obviously, and then our producer, Dara Whelan, who, who runs the show for us. Most importantly, I thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen in and engage with presenters and on the content through the webinar. And of course, don't forget that Tillage Thursday webinars will continue and we look forward to seeing you next Thursday, February 3rd, for the CAP23 webinar, which will look at the changes to the CAP and how farmers can deal with this through 2023. So that's it from Oak Park. Take care and stay safe.